Wow. I, I, I'm going to give my own opinion in a second, but I might as well just get, I only have three more questions for you, maybe even two and a half, because we have a power chat from RRC11 underscore 11 saying, can you ask Ben if the wage cap is something Todd would also keep? I assume, though, this fits in line a little bit with what you just said in the last answer, where we keep pretending, or not everybody does, but we're acting like, okay, that's all Badad and Clear Lake, or that's all Todd, whereas it's a little bit more of an overlap. Is the wage cap also something you would say it's not entirely one or the other? Yeah, I think they both want the incentive-driven structure. There's definitely mm. no issue with that, although it is important to note that in the Bowley window, including Sterling, there wasn't an incentive-driven structure. And after that, when Egg Barley got involved, there was. So I think sources make it clear that the concept of the incentive-driven structure and Champions League cuts and earning your earnings is driven by the Clear Lake side of the business because mm -hmm. Bowley had his entire tenure as sporting director where that wasn't there from day one. But he was having to work without any real support and at super speed. And then obviously as Windows developed and this four-window plan that's just finished closed, they'd had more time and more resources and more people to input into that. So I don't even think the wage structure is a point of contention. And I don't even think that we can view it as ownership level only. I think the sporting directors and the wider leadership team are heavily invested in that. And actually, that's not a point of contention because many, many clubs do that, Manchester United being one of them. So it's kind yeah. of just the best practice that gets a lot of focus on it. And that's down to the fact that when Abramovich wanted something, he spent what he needed and wanted without really thinking about it to try and get immediate success. But if you do that now, then modern football isn't necessarily as conducive to success. And there's no guarantee if Abramovich had stayed and just continued and continued and continued with his strategy that Chelsea would have succeeded. They may have constantly taken small steps back and then found themselves in financial ruin once we got to the point where all of these potential breaches come out there or just other more modern football clubs play catch up. So I think the incentive driven structure is one example of modernizing the club and bringing it up to best practices with what a lot of other clubs, at least in England, do. And there's yeah. no point of contention there. And I also think regarding the finances, you have due diligence that was done at super speed and you have all parties, Clear Lake, Bowley, everyone at the football club, well aware that they've inherited some skeletons in the closet. So right. part of what Chelsea have done with data, with medicine, with infrastructure, with wage bill, and part of what Chelsea will potentially have to do if anything develops with these Premier League possible charges is react to what they inherited and inherited at great pace and urgency without a traditional period of up to nine months for due diligence. So when people sort of say this might be an issue with the club or that might be an issue with the club, we also have to make it clear that the retrospective issues were inherited from Roman Abramovich, but yeah. so, by the way, were 21 trophies. And the forward-thinking aspects to tackle, like academy or stadium or youth-led recruitment, that's a brand new strategy and culture. And there are more points of difference and contention with the proactive, forward-thinking, implemented strategy since summer 2022 than there are with the things that were deemed to be issues or problems with the club that were inherited and needed fixing. And those solutions or fixes are more things like where's the data and the connection, where's the functional global scouting, where's the long-term budgeting, where's the pathways, where's the youth-led policy, where's the lowering of the average age and wage, Where's the ability to protect big players from leaving on free transfers or entering into the last two years of the contract? All of those, my understanding has always been that most parties at the football club are on the same page. Mm -hmm. Then you look forwards and you say, what are we going to do with Stamford Bridge? What do we need to succeed now and add trophy number 22, the first for the men's side post Abramovich? What mm -hmm. departments do we need at the club? How can we improve fan engagement? How can we change the culture at Cobham? How can we make sure that a manager stays for 10 years instead of 10 minutes? These are the more 
clear like bowly conversations that are not intrinsically linked to the Abramovich era where there are differing opinions. And I think what started out as healthy debate has Mm. become now a more strained relationship to the point where maybe it is the case of we see either Clear Lake assuming control or Bowley assuming control. Yeah. You mentioned the stadium, and I do want to just get a little bit more specific there on what might be the disagreement, because I would say in the last 24 hours, we have had stadium be one of the major things that has been mentioned as a point of disagreement between the two parties. But on the fan engagement part there, Pice had a laugh in the chat, not at you, but at that nattering to them upstairs. We felt like when Bowley, I'm speaking as a Chelsea fan here, Ben, and I'm not going to speak for the fan base, but I know a lot of fans feel like this. We felt like Bowley did care about coming into London, a place he's not from, right? A sport he doesn't know, which he was admitting of, and not ruining the culture, making it really American and forgetting about the fan. He even said, I'm sure you've seen it. When you get a little bit lost, think about the fan. And I, I, I'm not under this you know, disillusion, Ben, that owners are always doing interviews. That's not the case. I mean, fuck, Roman never did an interview and we didn't give a shit because we won. So I'm not sitting here saying that I expect transparency constantly from owners. With that said, we do get the feeling, I won't say I'm not speaking for everybody, but a lot of fans do get the feeling that Bowley has the fan in mind a little bit more than Iqbali. Do you get that sense? Is that fair to say? Am I just speculating? I mean, I'm just saying what I feel ultimately, so that's all. Yeah, I think that there's a misrepresentation from day one that Bowley's the face and voice of the club. And Bowley's the one pulling the strings. And of course, there was a point where Bowley was literally doing everything. He was the minority owner, the face, the voice, the sporting director, the chair, etc. And at that point, when Czech left, Marina left, Buck went, of course, it felt like it was a Bowley club. And yeah. then due to the fact that the sort of tender for the club became a bit of a popularity contest, it very much felt like Bowley FC. But as I said, even before they won, Egg Barley was always going to be hands on. If you go back to the reporting, I would say in April, uh-huh. which was two months before they even had the club, I was reporting that Egg Barley will be heavily invested, will be heavily involved, and will be highly influential. And of course, you'd expect that because from day one, Clear Lake Capital has always been the majority owner of the football club. So, this idea that sort of Bowley is the relatable face and Clear Lake Capital are the faceless investment firm, has always been misrepresentative. And every time anyone's ever seen Bowley say anything, do anything, he becomes kind of caricatured almost and gleans all the headlines. And when things are going well, it's what's Bowley cooking. And when things are bad, it's Bowley's making a terrible meal. But behind the scenes, it's never been like that at Chelsea. It's always been Egg Barley, Feliciano and Bowley. And Clear Lake have always been driving everything about the football club. And in that sort of viral video with Laporta, with the we'll here to have a meal clip, you'll note that Egg Barley was there as well. And that's a very forgotten point in all of this. It's never just been about Bowley. So does Bowley have more of an affinity with the fan base? I'm not so sure. Does Bowley have more of an affinity with football from day one? Probably, because he tried to buy Tottenham before Chelsea, so there was always an interest. And does Bowley have more experience with fans, fan engagement and sport? Well, yes, because he's been involved in the Dodgers. He's done projects with fan engagement. He's done renovations. So from day one, more of a sense of a modern sports fan. But that's not to say that Egg Barley... It just views the fan as a statistic or a player as a commodity. That's an oversimplification. But I think the sector that Bowley comes from in and outside of sport is all framed around how do we create something that gives value for money for the fan, mm. whereas a firm like Clear Lake are all about how do we get money and value from a fan. And there is a slight difference because for a fan, 
might mean you need to spend. For a fan might mean you need to think about modernization. You might need to think about experience. You might need to think about culture. And you might need to lose money to get to where you need to be before you make money. Whereas investment firms are often thinking not about what's for, but what they actually need to do and spend first. Right. And therefore, you may need to get your money from the fan in order to get where you need to be. So there will be a more natural business decision with these kind of firms, and I'm speaking broadly rather than specifically about Clear Lake, to say, OK, from the fan, we need more money for tickets. From the fan, we need more buy-in to move away from Stamford Bridge. From the fan, we need more patience so our project can work. And in this case, the two marrying together should be very healthy because you have a investment firm that will ultimately want a return on investment. You have a passionate series of individuals within that investment firm that understand money, creative financial loopholes, how to get the club through difficult times and how ultimately to raise more revenue. And they are passionate about football. So nobody's saying they don't care about the fans. And then if you add all the Bowley points that I've mentioned and his experience in the Dodgers on paper, that should be all the assets you need to cover all bases and have a very successful project and football club. But with that many voices and that many opinions, if they don't all agree and can't get on the same strategic page, then as I said earlier, there becomes too many cooks. So it's a difficult question to answer because if you outline the different skill sets simply, then they've got everything they need now. And you would logically say, great, just get in a room, keep your debate professional, don't let it get personal, and you've got all of the expertise necessary to make this work. Right. But if they can't, then you sort of have to go with one or the other. Right. Right. Uh, on the stadium, I got to ask, because it's just not the stuff that I retain as well as footballing stuff. What is the issue there? What does one want to do that the other isn't doing, vice versa? Yeah, I think if we break down the stadium, so like I said before, from the Bowley side, they made a pitch when they bought the football club. That was one of the requirements with Rain Group that you had to in depth address the stadium. And they went down the line of basically taking Roman's failed redevelopment plan and saying, this is what we'll likely do. And they hired Janet Marie Smith, an architect who oversaw the Dodgers renovation. And they said, this is likely our approach, although, of course, it wasn't binding. And then after they were successful with the club, they started to look at all the different aspects. First of all, they realised that planning permission from under Abramovich was expired. So they had to go through that whole process again. And then they started to speak to various stakeholders to work out what their options were. And as we now know, subsequently also buy land in and around Stanford Bridge to give them the opportunity if they knock down the stadium or expand the stadium to have a little bit more space to work with. But it's not perfect, right? And that whole process took something in the region of the first 18 months of owning the football club without having decided yet whether they were going to do stand-by-stand, stand, some form of other renovation, knock down Stanford Bridge or build on a new site. Then about that point, Chris Jurasek had come in and obviously now Jason Gannon and the Clear Lake side of the business said, the priority here is not to work out the best of only a tricky site to work with, is to exhaust all possibilities to see whether there's another site, to see whether there's something that we can do with the surrounding land to make it a more perfect venue, or whether we have to commit to some kind of standby stand renovation still, but what does that look like and how do we make sure that it's not just a continual need to renovate, still not getting the stadium up to the same kind of standard as SoFi or the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium? And the clear Lakers that I know can't get out of their head this Tottenham Hotspur stadium. And mm. the idea that new will always be better, new will always be perfect, new yeah. will always be future proof, new will always be a better revenue driver. And if you can get to new with some hurdles along the way, that's the best way. 
but of course, this isn't like Tottenham where there's a nice plot of land right next to the old White Hart Lane and there's a stadium in North London. This is Chelsea and there's huge contention about moving away from Stamford Bridge, whether permanently or temporarily. You have to get the right stakeholders' permission, otherwise you can't do it anyway. And there is no perfect solution, nor is there a perfect venue where you can move to. So whatever decision they make, there's going to be short-term uproar. Because right. if you do stand-by-stand, stand, it's disruptive, and people might not like the end product. If you knock down Stamford Bridge, then most people would say, well, at least we're building on the same site, but you've got to find somewhere to play. If you stay at Stamford Bridge and you find a new site, then you've got to get permission to bring the Chelsea brand and the name there, and you're still going to get people saying, well, we liked our old location. So they can't win with everybody, and the Bowley side, I'm told, were more inclined to lead on the project. So it's not so much a disagreement on what to do, because everyone accepts each option that I've said is difficult. And it's more about who actually will lead on it. And the Bowley side are firmly of the belief, I'm told, that they have the stadium experts and that this is their project. And that yeah. when you have... Jonathan Goldstein, who is a property developer, when you have Todd Bowley, who's led on a Dodger renovation, when you have an architect that had been hired for the best part of two years, when you have Danny Finkelstein, who isn't in either camp, by the way, but was asked by the Bowley side to be part of the government relations team, the feeling was on the Bowley side that they built that team. So therefore, right. once they'd got through the first 18 months, the next 18 months, which have basically now finished, would result in some clarity by the end of this year and actually going from something that was theoretical to practical with all of the right people to manage the right relationships. So uh, Goldstein is important because he works in the world of property. He's built hotels before. So it's not a problem for him to go into London and get planning permission. Finkelstein's important because he knows government. Bowley's important because he's actually done a, a renovation before. So mm. they understand the challenges, the people in the market. And then from Clear Lake's point of view, when Chris Juracek came in, it, it became about let's put all options on the table, including personnel that are leading this. And then the drive for the stadium, to my knowledge effectively, maybe about six months ago, moved from Bowley people to Clear Lake people, specifically Jurassic to now Gannon, instead of Bowley and Goldstein and Janet Marie Smith to an extent. And Janet Marie Smith listed herself as the lead architect for future Chelsea redevelopment and then six months ago deleted that from her website, which <laughs> tells you that there's been a shift in personnel yeah. And I'm not one to say that's right or wrong. It's not up to me to say whether that set the project back, whether that's wise, whether that's unwise. But it's clear in the simplest of terms that the predominant drive towards stadium redevelopment has moved from Bowley people to Clear Lake people. And because Gannon is full time, that does make some sense. And in his job title, you'd expect him to be involved. And in fairness, he does have experience overseeing SoFi. So you, you have someone that's coming a bit later in the project that does have genuine and very impressive stadium experience. So it would be very normal that he would be heavily involved in it as well. But when you change that dynamic, you change what everyone wants once again, and then you have to reconsult, you have to relook at sites, you have to relook at planning permission, you have to relook at cost, you have to relook at design. So the project was in a relatively advanced theoretical stage and ready to be taken to stakeholders. And now it's probably been set back a year because they've decided to reassess options, which is why it feels like there's been no progress on the stadium redevelopment. And that is largely due to the fact that in the very simplest terms, it's moved from Bowley predominant control to Clear Lake predominant control, but still, it's all Chelsea. So it's not like Bowley doesn't have a say. It's just it's not his project anymore. It's a Clear Lake driven project on behalf of Chelsea instead of a Bowley one. 
Gotcha. Very informative. Uh, it's like I said, not something I retain all that well when it's about the stadium, but I did know, okay, Goldstein's here for this reason, like you outlined. I mean, he's done it before Finkelstein government, like you said, um, and it's all kind of gotten away from that point. Uh, the last thing I specifically want to ask you about is of course it's speculative, but listen, Bowley needs, if Bowley is going to, if we're going to go off of what's out there now, if Bowley is going to get investors to help him out with financial backing to buy out Badad and Clear Lake, then of course he's going to need some money. Apparently there's confidence. And we know, Ben, that he's got a friend. He's got a friend. I mean, he's got many friends. He's got many friends. But of course, we it's been very well outlined, um, his relationship with Amanda Stavely, who of course was at Newcastle and just in general, we know Bodhi, Bo Bodhi. Wow, I just combined what I'm about to say of Foley <laughs> and Saudi. Um, but Amanda herself, when she left and back in July, was like, hey, we, uh, you know, we might be buying another stake in a football club. So that's partially why we have to go. You think there's anything there or no idea? Well, I think, first of all, Staverley was, to my knowledge, forced out of Newcastle. So I don't think okay. we can look at her exit as for another reason other than pretty much from day one and the length that takeover took, sources had said her days might be numbered and yep. her percentage of 10 was diluted to six and then zero. So mm -hmm. this was a long-term plan to effectively drive her out of Newcastle United or she was never really meant to be there in the first place and everything took so long that she ended up staying longer than when she first brokered that deal was to be expected. And as a consequence, we shouldn't read too much into her departure and presume that she's ready to take another hands-on stake in another football club because Amanda Staverley is a broker, not necessarily a minority investor or owner. That's her area of expertise. And of course, people will naturally say, well, couldn't she broker a deal or couldn't Bowley go and find some Saudi money? But remember... The direct link with Saudi, even though Bowley has a lot of contacts out there, is actually Clear Lake and PIF, not uh. necessarily Bowley and PIF. And PIF would not be able to get involved anyway because of their ownership of Newcastle United. So mm -hmm. a lot of people have said, well, Bowley will go off and get a load of Saudi money and then be in a natural position where he can go to Clear Lake with an offer that's too good to turn down. I'm not so sure that the Saudi market would be the one if he chose to do that. He may have another means of getting funds. And of course, you can just borrow the funds using standard investment banks in order to meet the number required for Clear Lake to leave and then yeah. worry about finding the investors later. Because Bowley may say he wants to be a majority owner or he wants to be like Jim Ratcliffe and have 13 percent but have sporting control and then find the right silent partners or investors further down the line. So a traditional approach would be find the investors and then form a new consortium and use the new investors to buy out Clear Lake. But there is also a way where Bowley just raises capital or borrows capital and then worries about other people coming into the club at a much later date. And it would therefore be staggered in a way to get him 100% of the club with a view then to selling a portion of it because maybe he doesn't want to invest that much money. So we shouldn't presume that Bowley's just got a brand new group up his sleeve right now because it's not even got to that point where anyone's having a conversation or anybody is bidding at this point. And the other thing is that there are a lot of investors that wanted Chelsea as part of this super speed tender two years ago that are still there. So who's to say that some of those other investors will not feel like what Chelsea have built and at the price available, it's good value to come back in the mix. I don't think anybody that entered that race for Chelsea at super speed only two years ago, if given the opportunity to get a slice of the pie, would be averse to having a conversation because you don't go from four or five groups all pledging 2.5 billion to four of those five groups that were unsuccessful just walking away and saying we're not interested anymore because the same asset is still there right. and 
people will naturally presume that the value of the asset has gone down, but it hasn't. It's risen. And right. if you see an asset that hasn't got Champions League football, has had a lot of turmoil, has had a lot of managerial changes, and is still worth more than the price that the group paid for it, that's a fantastic sign if you're an investor because you're thinking, wow, this price is only going to rise. And, you know, the reason why, of course, the price has risen is because, first of all, they got it a little bit cheaper than the enterprise market value due to the fact that Abramovich had to sell at super speed. And then now, because you have a Manchester United sale as a yardstick, you have Daniel Levy looking for minority investment and Tottenham's being put out there on the market at 3.5 million. You've had Liverpool who have sought minority investment, even though it was only a small amount. But again, there's still 100% valuation of the club out there. And when you look at all of those valuations, plus the fact that the parent company at the moment have bought Strasbourg as well and have moved into multi-club, it would be normal to think that the Chelsea valuation is a billion more minimum than the price that the group paid for it, which was just right. under 2.5 billion. Now, that isn't to say that Chelsea has raised by a billion in two years. It's to say that they got a club that was probably worth at least 3 billion, let's call it, for 2.3 yeah. billion. And then since then, even though they've not made Champions League football and have had a lot of turmoil, the price in the modern market has risen by another 0.5 million because everyone's aware that they've got multi club, they've put money into academy, they've bought talents for the future, they're in the Club World Cup, they've got a new stadium at some point on the horizon. And to somebody that wants to come in now for the next 10 years, they may be prepared to overpay on the enterprise value of the football club because they know that they're going to be a part of that and they trust that with all of these things developing, the value is going to raise even further. So it would not be unthinkable that 2.3 billion becomes 3.5 billion or more. And therefore, it is very marketable to an investor because they equally believe that when you then add all the things that the fans expect, like trophies and Champions League football, 3.5 yeah. or 4 billion becomes 5 or 5.5 billion. And when the Glazers made this argument, they got derided. Why are the Glazers looking for 8 to 10 billion now when Manchester United's a mess? But if you look at Ratcliffe and how quickly he's starting to plan for the new stadium, and if you think about the summer they've had, and if you think about that project stabilising, whether with Ten Hag or without him, eventually the Glazers' valuation might actually be quite accurate. And if Manchester United becomes 8 to 10 million, then Chelsea's always going to be 6 to 8 billion. And um, again, if you come in now at 3.5 or 4 billion, you might feel that you're going to be able to double up your money within 10 years. So if Bowley does seek investors, um, I don't think he'll be short of suitors. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Pice, I'm giving you a chance here to ask Ben a question because I am questioned out. Actually, I do have one more, so go <laughs> ahead, Pice. No, it's, it's actually just off the back of that, Ben. So talking about like potential investors, couldn't the simple solution be the guy that already has a stake, Mark Walter, he, ha he is the CEO of Guggenheim Partners, who control $325 billion in assets. Couldn't the simple solution be that Mark Water just basically gives Spoli some, some extra billions and, and that's it's like in-house then, you know? You don't have to go searching for a new partner as such because Mark's already there. He has the access to that massive fund. I'd be surprised just purely because if it's as neat as you've just outlined, which is a fair take then why wouldn't they have just done that on the first place? There's a reason why Bowley needed Clear Lake to get to the 100% valuation of Chelsea. Sure. And if Guggenheim wanted Chelsea, as you rightly say, they could have bought Chelsea two years ago. They didn't. And I don't personally see that changing. I think what's more likely is just that Bowley won't think about finding a hands-on partner at this point or bringing in the right people I think if he feels that it needs to be resolved urgently, he'll raise by borrowing the capital necessary and has enough assets that he can do that. And then he'll worry about finding the partners at a later date to make sure that he's not just a 100% owner having loaned out X amount of money, roughly 2.5 billion to take the other 62% of the club. Because that's a slight worry, of course, from Chelsea's point of view 
if Bowley at 13% jumps up to 62% and his other two partners, Hans-Jörg Weiss and Mark Walter, stay. So that's why the maths take you to 100%. There's a worry if he uses borrowed money for that 62%, uh, especially if there's any suggestion that that could impact the club's finances or the parent company's finances. But he doesn't have to find an overnight partner to take the 62% or whatever the percentage is, because he might increase his own stake. He just has to raise capital. And there's two differences there. Raising capital, you can do by borrowing, and then you can auction the percentage of the club that you want to sell to an investor at a later date, or he could find a partner from day one. And would that be Guggenheim? Like I say, it would be surprising. They're right there, though. Like, well, yeah, but know, they were the, right there two yeah. years ago as well. Yeah, but like... I, I don't see like so you you're basically saying that when you say borrow money, so do you mean take debt on the club? Well it wouldn't be directly on the club, it would be on Bowley and his businesses, but he could decide that he wants to resolve the situation first by borrowing the money necessary to buy out his partners and then thereafter he may put a proportion of the club on the market. So that would allow him to structure a deal that he could get done quickly without having to vet or worry about what kind of partners want to come in or what kind of role those partners will have. Because you, you suspect with Bowley, if he wants all of the club, that he's either going to want to be like Ratcliffe as a minority stakeholder, but with more silent partners, so he gets control. Or alternatively, he's going to want to be the majority owner, so he's going to have to go from 13% to <laughs> 51% to have control. And in doing that, he would have to find a fair amount of money. And if he does that out of his personal funds, then it may be that he chooses to borrow. But if he borrows, then it would be very surprising if that was borrowing against Chelsea rather than borrowing as an individual. So, you know, with Ratcliffe, he has also borrowed, but he's saddling that debt against Ineos, not Manchester United. And it would likely be very similar with Bowley. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my la last question, Ben, I know we've said it a bunch, but last question, just a little clarity on the overall 10 year minimum rule. I assume that's just between everyone who owns Chelsea right now. It just can't be fully sold from you know everyone within 10 years. Yeah, I mean, the 10 year binding commitment has loopholes and we know that Chelsea have been able to find loopholes in the past. So yeah. they are allowed to switch shares between each other. That's the first yeah. thing. And therefore, Clear Lake could buy out Bowley and his investors and Bowley could buy out Clear Lake. And that's fine because they're just switching shares between the original group. Right. Under extenuating circumstances, they can auction the club as well, mm. but they can only all depart to a brand new owner within a 10-year period under extenuating circumstances. And those extenuating circumstances, to my knowledge, are things like bankruptcy or relegation out of their control or punishments or breaches of law or forced sale. There's not much else that allows them just to walk away. However, the loophole is how binding the 10 year commitment that they've made is and who exactly is going to stop them should they try and all exit earlier or breach the terms of this 10 year agreement, because it certainly isn't going to be rain group and it certainly isn't going to be Chelsea football clubs legal department. And it's very, very unlikely to be Roman Abramovich who the binding commitment was ultimately set by. And then when you add the facts, which is another complication that the money that, they used to buy the football club is still frozen in a government account. Who knows whether or not they could argue that the sale itself is effectively void anyway, and therefore so are the terms and conditions because the money that they've paid to buy the football club hasn't actually been distributed as was originally said. Mm -hmm. So I think people are fixated on the 10 year binding commitment. And it is true on paper that a commitment was made that they would keep the majority owner for 10 years or they would switch shares between themselves within a 10-year period. 
So 100% Bowley's fine, 100% Clear Lake's fine, or any additional share shifts between them is fine. But let's just say hypothetically right now, earlier than 10 years, they turned around and said, well, both of us are going to go. Then at that point, even though there is a 10-year commitment, I'm not so sure that it will be legally binding enough that it would stop them from re-auctioning the club. And I think that they would be able to put forward arguments to the relevant parties to break that commitment, largely because, as I said before, it's not going to be the government that block them. It's not going to be Rain that block them. It's not going to be Chelsea that block them. And I don't think that it'd be Abramovich that blocks them either. And if the government try and block them, they'll turn around and say, well, you haven't even distributed our funds where you said you were going to distribute them in two plus years. Mm. If Chelsea's legal team turned around and said, you've got no ability to leave, then they'd find a new legal team in likelihood. And obviously, Rain Group are not the kind of entity that have any control over the terms. So, yes. They said that they would have a 10-year commitment, but is it legally binding to the point where if they auction the club, there'd be any issues? I doubt it. Um, but that 10-year commitment is there, in fact, the 30-year commitment on the Bowley side. So we're not talking about an eventuality where either of the two parties wants to sell to a third party. We're yeah. talking about the opposite, where both Clear Lake and Bowley want to up their investments, both emotional and financial and share to the point where they've got even more control over the club. So this isn't going to end in each wanting to buy each other, not being able to come to an agreement and then neither having the football club and putting it to market. This is only going to end in either Clear Lake or Bowley likely having a majority or 100% stake in the club, um, or in the case of Bowley, potentially buying out Clear Lake with a new investor, but then like Ratcliffe, having the actual sporting control and the path to eventual control. And when you look at it that way, the only thing they need to do is get in a room and work out if this is going to materialise, because we're speaking about this as if it's developed to the point of, the parties in a room, the parties starting talks, the parties discussing a structure, the parties discussing price. And it's normal because everyone sees the headline and particularly with outlets like Bloomberg and Financial Times and they think, OK, something's definitely happening. And I think that's right. But it hasn't happened yet. So we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves with what the next step is. Um, I think it was Max I saw earlier uh, saying they've got to resolve it this week so we know where we stand for the season. Well, it's never going to be resolved in a, a week. Even if they have clarity really soon, it's takeover. So it's it's going to take likely, even if they started it today, the entire season, just to resolve what they're going to do. Um, so I think you have to kind of understand until they get in a room and work out a plan for which one is actually going to put a bid in front of the other one, right. we're not really going to get a grasp and a timescale uh, over this. And the much more contentious conclusion is that Bowley tries to buy out Clear Lake and Clear Lake don't want to go. So then you actually make the situation worse because Bowley's trying to usurp Clear Lake as majority owner and Clear Lake are saying no. And then Bowley's in an impossible position where he may have to go from trying to buy the football club to leaving the football club. Because if he fails, then it's completely untenable for him to stay. Right. And if it's the other way around and Clear Lake just say, look, we actually want to buy you out and we're already the majority owner. And we've already got our model and we've already got our staff and we've already got our structure. That's a much smoother kind of sale and takeover. Uh, which is why I think Clear Lake are in a um, stronger position than Bowley, uh, because their potential purchase of Bowley, if it heads in that direction, is going to be a much smoother transaction than the other way around. Right. It's much more straightforward in that way. Well, listen, Ben, uh, this is all far from straightforward, but you did uh, a very good job at straightening it out as much as possible, for at least myself. I can only speak for myself. So, 
Thank you so much for coming on for more than an hour, especially since it was impromptu on your Saturday evening. It means extra to me. As always, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. Have a good weekend, everyone. All right. You too. There's Ben Jacobs, who was more than kind enough to give us a hell of a lot of time there. And like I said, that was impromptu. That was me 